during this time of COVID-19, uh, we've been kicking around, are there better ways to maybe bring lessons or messages from time to time, rather than me sitting on the stage in that big empty auditorium, trying to present some wisdom uh, from the Bible or from following Jesus. And uh, Neil Campbell came up with an idea that I think is pretty profound and it's going to require me finding an old used cast iron pan. Wish me luck. Good afternoon. Hey. Is there anything I can help you with? I am looking for, you know, those heavy duty iron pans. Um, but I really would like one to stretch. Do you have anything like a black iron pan? Old timey looking. I've got a few over here. Let me show them to you. I have these three right here. Different sizes, different shapes. We're looking for something that's kind of distressed, kind of you know what I'm talking about? These look great. These, are, these aren't right, what we're looking for. Right, right. Um, I do have an old rusted one that I threw in the trash. Let me show that to you. I have this old one right here that I threw away. Yes, that is exactly what I am looking for. So how much, how much for something like this? I'll tell you what, you take it. I was throwing it in the trash, and if that's what you're looking for, you take it. Oh my goodness. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This you're is going to be right. This is you're exactly welcome. right. Thank you enjoy. You. Thank you. In my life, I'm surrounded by some incredible cooks, and they tell me that these are all incredible pots and pans and basically are good for just about anything, and yet, in some people's eyes, they see something worthwhile in an old pan like this. And they tell me that even with some love, uh, something like this can even be transformed into something beautiful. There is something beautiful and satisfying about seeing things restored. We're working on the pan now. That's beautiful. I think it's going to be beautiful. But really, other areas of life, I've seen restoration, and I have just been so fascinated by it. I have seen people, not many, but I've seen a few who just had an eye for picking out furniture that was beautiful, but somehow it had lost its beauty. It was now messed up. It was uh, maybe been painted over a lot of times. It just had lost everything that you could see beautiful about it. But these individuals just had the ability to see it and they knew with a little TLC, they could bring it to life. I bet you've seen that too. I've got a friend, his name is Mike, and Mike has been involved in cars his whole life. And Mike, he can get a car out of a junkyard. I'm talking about a car that has been in the junkyard for 50 years. I mean, Weeds growing up out of it, the engine rusted and gone, sides of the car eaten away. You and I would see it and we'd say, that is just a hunk of junk. But Mike sees it and Mike in this patient way that he has will just day by day by day bring it back to life. And he has in his garage today, he has cars from the 30s, the 40s, the 50s, that are better than anything any of us will ever drive. And they're more expensive than anything I will ever drive. But it's because a master has restored it. I like seeing restorations of houses. I bought this house about 15 years ago. And I had always bought just decent houses, always just kind of run-of-the-mill houses, never really did much work on them. But this house had been built in 1930. It's 90 years old now. Built in 1930, and it had become a mess. If you can believe this, most of the ceilings in the downstairs of this house, they were falling in. 
uh, in this house, there was even a, a drop ceiling in the dining room. And when I explored, after I bought it, I wasn't the wisest buyer in the world. After I explored it, I discovered that there was aluminum siding above the drop ceiling to catch water from an upstairs bathroom that was leaking and then would be like a gutter and just lead the water outside. And it's like, oh my, I don't think it's supposed to be like that. But I had a friend. Many of you may remember Santa Steve Donaldson. He was my best buddy. And Santa Steve just understood old houses. And he just understood what it meant to give it some love and a little bit of wisdom and a little bit of time. And he and I began to work together. And when I say I worked with him, I'm using that term very loosely. I, I actually just followed him around. He was the master. I was just the apprentice. But over a year and a half, we restored this old, old, old house into something that's really beautiful. So I guess whether it's a iron skillet or whether it's a piece of furniture or a car or an old house, there's just something really beautiful about a restoration story. An old discarded pan that was in the garbage, but there's still so much value here and so now we're gonna begin the process of restoration. Okay, let's do a little cleanup. Let's see what can happen with a little bit of cleanup here. This reminds me a little bit about you know, Christianity, baptism. <laughs> we always, it's, it's uh, something that we do. It's kind of a beautiful symbol of being cleansed and understanding that that cleansing is head to toe, that you're brand new. We do this right. This is going to make this pan look like it's brand new. When I read the Bible, I really see restoration on almost every page. You see it first in the first story, the, the Genesis story, the creation story. And uh, people ask me all the time, do you believe that story? Absolutely, I believe it. I believe that what happens in that story happens in every life. You'll remember the story, beautiful creation, God loving God, God creates humanity, God is walking with man and woman, beautiful thing but then bad choices are made. And suddenly these two who felt innocent, naked, unashamed, suddenly they felt damaged. They felt broken. They felt very much ashamed. They felt dead, if you will. In fact, that death was a death every single one of us goes through in our growing up process. I know I have felt that. But what we discover in the story is not what I thought as a child, that God was so mad and God said, get out of my garden and I'm never going to have anything to do with you again. But no, rather God pursues these humans who feel like they are broken. God pursues them and says, I want to restore you. I want your life to be all it can be. You know, I don't know about you, but I know that in my own life, I have found bushes to hide in because of my nakedness, because of the damage that has happened to me. And I have discovered God all the time coaxing me and saying, you don't have to hide. You don't have to be ashamed. You don't have to be afraid because I love you. God never abandons us. The story of humanity is honestly a story of God pursuing so he can restore us to the life that we know we could have. There's a prophecy in Joel in the Old Testament, and it's as if God were talking. It's in Joel chapter two, and it says this, I will restore to you the years that the swarming locusts have eaten. And I want you to think about that. That's God saying, whatever you feel like you've lost, I want to give it back to you. I want your life to be better than you ever could have imagined. I want to restore you. So many of us, we look at the losses in our life, the hurt in our life, the damage in our life, and we blame other people. We say, 
of course, my, my parents didn't love me or my best friend betrayed me or my spouse divorced me or my boss fired me or it's somebody else. And maybe all of those things have happened. Or we end up looking at ourselves and say, no, I'm the bonehead. I'm the one that screwed everything up. I'm the one that made these terrible decisions. I'm the one that um, ran with the wrong crowd. I'm the one that quit school. I'm the one that started the addictive behavior. It's me, it's me, it's me. But you know the truth, it's not really other people. And it's not you. It's just life. All of us find ourselves in life at times feeling a little bit broken, a little bit like we've lost what we originally had. That's why I think it's so beautiful to see God wanting to restore us, wanting to make us whole, wanting to bring back to us all that we originally were intended to have. There's a great story in, in Jeremiah in the Old Testament, chapter 18. Jeremiah goes to a potter's house. He feels compelled by God to go to a potter's house and he is watching a potter spinning clay on a wheel, uh, forming a vessel. And he's thinking, okay, I'm understanding this. This is evidently the nation of Israel, or maybe these, this represents individuals. And the potter is God, and this vessel is being made. But then he sees that the vessel is marred. The vessel is scarred. The vessel has issues. And instead of throwing the clay away, the potter just begins to restore it and make a beautiful vessel even out of the clay that had been marred. Again, I love restoration stories and I love in my life having seen hundreds of stories of people who felt like their life had been damaged by life, but they discovered in love, love that we believe is God, love, healing them, restoring them, making them whole again. There's a scripture in 1 Peter chapter 5. Uh, this is what Peter writes. After you have suffered a little while, that's life, after you've suffered in life, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore you. And that word restore is the same word that fishermen used when they would mend their nets. That idea of there are issues with the nets, but we are going to gently restore them. We are going to mend them. And that's what the Bible says, that God is doing the very same thing. He is restoring us. He is mending us. What did the psalmist David say in the 23rd Psalm? God restores my soul. This is the pan we started with. Remember how rusty it was? Now it looks incredible, but it took a lot of work, a lot of time, and a lot of care. First thing that I did is I took a Brillo pad and scrubbed all the rust off. Then we soaked it in a mixture of vinegar and water, 50-50 mix, and we soaked it to again clean this pan. To remove previous layers of seasoning, we put this in the oven upside down and put it on self-cleaning mode, the oven on self-cleaning mode, and that brought it back to its original metal condition. To re-season the pan, I put it in the oven at 300 degrees for 10 minutes. Then I took it out and rubbed it down with flaxseed oil. Then we turned the oven back up to 480 degrees. We put it in upside down and we left it for an hour. We did that process four different times. We turned off the oven and we left the pan in the oven until it was cool to touch. We started with a 70 year old rusted discarded iron pan, but with love and care, we have brought it back to brand new. <laughs> I guess I was naive, not a guess, I, I was naive. As a real young man, I thought the idea was to just kind of be perfect, never be marked, never be scarred, never have any kind of blemish. Um, that caused me to perform or put on 
for many, many years because I really thought that was the objective. That's what we all wanted to have. And I didn't realize until much later that no, it is sometimes the struggles that we go through, the hurts, the pains, overcoming those things, dealing with those things, that's what really makes us um, really beautiful. I was with a guy a couple of weeks ago and he was telling me about some issues he's had in his life and he said, you may not even want to hang out with me after you hear all of this stuff. And it's like, are you kidding me? What I see is someone who has been through some struggles, who has found his life kind of marred, discarded even. But you have discovered this great restoration God who is helping you put all the pieces back together. Now, you end up being marked by some of those scars. Uh, the Bible talks about Jacob walking with a limp after some of the struggles of his life. We sometimes have that limp and that just kind of identifies us as those who have had some scars. Now, you used to think that the ob objective was to never let anybody see those things, but I've realized it is in letting people see where we've come from. I mean, we are those pieces of furniture that have been discarded. We are that car in the junkyard. We are that house that's been abandoned or mistreated for 90 years. But when we understand this great God and this great love, things begin to heal. Things begin to get better. Paul talks about the fact that people who think they're perfect, they don't really fit in in the kingdom of God. It's really people who understand they've been through restoration, that God has taken them from a place of vulnerability and God has restored them. I, I did this paraphrase myself. It's 1 Corinthians, the first chapter, just a couple of the verses, but this is what I sense Paul saying. Not many of you were shiny or perfect. You were damaged by life and you recognized that you needed restoring. And that is exactly what God has done for you. Listen, I want you to know our God, the God that we teach about, the God that we believe in, he is not a vindictive God. He is not an angry God. He is a restoring God. Just like the man who wants to restore the car, God sees your life and he wants to help make it better. He wants to help you in healing. He wants to mend your life. And I don't know of anything that excites me more. I learned a poem when I was a kid. It's amazing to me how sometimes these poems will stick with you, but this one especially because it was about just kind of the power of someone who understands or masters something and can bring it back to life. Let me see if I remember it. Twas battered and scarred, and the auctioneer thought it scarcely worth his while to waste much time on the old violin, but he held it up with a smile. And he said, what's my bid? Good folks, he cried, who'll start the bidding for me? A dollar, only one, then two, only two. Two dollars and who'll make it three? Three dollars once, three dollars twice, and going for three. But no! From the room afar back, a gray-haired man, he came forward and he picked up the bow. Then wiping the dust from the old violin and tightening just a few strings, he played a melody pure and sweet as the choiring angels sing. Then placing the violin back on the stand and with a voice that was quiet and dim, the auctioneer said to the stunned, silent crowd, What now for the old violin? A thousand dollars. Who'll make it two? Two thousand. Who'll make it three? Three thousand once, three thousand twice, and going and gone, cried he, and the people cheered. But some of them said, Wait, we don't understand. What changed its worth? Swift came the reply, "'Twas the touch of a master's hand. And many a man with life out of tune and battered and scarred with sin, their auction cheap to a thoughtless crowd, much like the old violin, a glass of wine, a bowl of porridge, a game, they travel on. They're going once, they're going twice, they're going and they are almost gone. But then the master comes, 
The master comes and the foolish crowd never can understand the worth of a soul and the change that can be wrought by the touch of a master's hand. Let God restore those areas of your life that need restoring. And just know that's what he wants to do. We love you. I hope you have a great week. Thanks for following us on this restoration journey. Thank you.